everybody. Welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag. This is episode 52. And uh, even though I said it, episode 50 was going to be our last one. We were canceling this show forever. Uh, nobody else apparently took it upon themselves to do the canceling. Josh did the show last week, so now I guess I feel mostly obligated to continue it. So uh, we'll deal with that. If you have questions for us for the mailbag, please leave them in the comments of this YouTube video and or leave them in the comment uh, comment section on PCPro.com where this video is embedded. And then we'll look through those questions and uh, anything that's topical or uh, on topic, off topic, uh, recent, old news, whatever, we'll try to, try to filter them into something that's interesting for you. Um, let's go ahead and jump into what we've got this week. First question comes in from ShroudedWolf51. Asks, while trying to diagnose some high temps, I discovered that my Core i7-3770K had been delitted by my friend that I purchased it from. Now that I know I have a delitted CPU, is there any particular any particular care I should be providing it compared to one that had not been delitted? Um, that's kind of an interesting question. I assume that since you were diagnosing high temps, I guess I don't know if you've discovered what the problem was. The first thing you should be checking is that there is a good thermal interface between the die and the heat spreader on the 3770K. Um, assuming that you did that, as long as the processor is mounted in the um, uh, uh, socket correctly, and then the heat spreader will kind of be forced to be mounted correctly onto the processor die because of the retention mechanism on the 11... 50 whatever LGA 115 115x socket that you're using on it. I don't think there's anything else particular you need to do um, for that. Just if you are uninstalling it, be mindful that it's delitted, that it that the uh, 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 kind of retention mechanism may behave differently with it, and it might move around a little bit. You know, the be careful cracking the die, or be careful that you do not crack the die or chip the edges of it. This is something that happened a lot on. Um, say the, the 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 original AMD Thunderbird processors that were socketed but didn't have a heat spreader on the die. So uh, that was something that that we dealt with where you had a very tiny die and you had a very large heat sink that was sitting on it and sometimes as you were installing it, it would rock back and forth and it would actually chip off the corners of the die. So um, I don't think you'll have any issue with that if you're just dealing with the rather thin light heat spreader itself. But uh, you know, keep that in mind. And hey, next time, tell your buddy to let you know about that kind of stuff. It'd be really nice, really nice to know that ahead of time, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think so. Next question: RKB asks, "Will there be an APU with HBM in the near future? HBM being high bandwidth memory." Um, that's an interesting question. So an APU is a is a combined CPU GPU on a single die, and up through now. All of the AMD APUs have used system memory, so they're connecting to the same DDR4 memory that your processor connects to uh, through that same memory controller and interface and at the same speeds and throughputs and everything. For HBM, the potential is there to have on substrate memory that is close to local. Now there's two ways you could you could think about this theoretically. You could you could try to integrate the HBM into the die. That seems like a, a much more difficult task. The other one is to do what Intel did with the Kaby Lake G processor where it's not um, an APU exactly because the, the Kaby Lake G is still an Intel processor, an Intel quad core processor with its own integrated graphics still on that substrate with a discrete Radeon GPU with HBM memory. Now, there's no reason you couldn't design an APU that has uh, the memory a memory controller separate from the processor memory controller. The process the CPU could still use uh, the DDR4, DDR5 memory, whatever generation will be in at that point, while the graphics card, the graphics controller, the memory controller in the graphics portion of that chip could use HBM uh, on substrate, like, you know, just on the on the packaging of the uh, part itself. Now, if you look at what Intel's done with Kaby Lake G, they had to build a very specific interface for that, the EMIB. Uh, I'm not going to try to remember what that stands for, but it is a, a specific interface built to connect those two chips through a substrate, be uh, with less noise, still high bandwidth, um, and, and no, nothing you know interfering with that. So uh, it's possible that you would see that. But the other other thing you have to worry about is Kaby Lake G is a very expensive part. It goes into a thousand dollar nook and a seven hundred dollar nook and two thousand dollar laptops. APUs 
to, to date have been very low cost budget parts. So you're getting into a very complex system with pretty expensive memory into a budget part is really difficult to do. Is there a market for that at a higher price? Debatable, right? If you can get a high enough performance GPU, I think Cabby Lake G has proven that there is a market for that, even though I would argue that Intel's kind of using the market, or they're kind of they're not focusing on the areas they should with Cabby Lake G. So will there be Maybe. I mean, you're essentially asking if uh, if AMD is going to release a part that has integrated graphics with an HBM memory. I, I, th- I feel like that's something we'll see. Maybe it won't be HBM you know, or HBM2 specifically, but there will be some kind of on-chip local memory, frame buffer, what have you, for uh, integrated graphics on an AMD part. I, I think that's a reasonable assertion. Next question is from Prasanna Shinde. Asks, why are the generally larger 4K HDR televisions less expensive than 4K HDR monitors? How long until 4K 144 hertz monitors come down to mainstream prices? Uh, so there's probably a couple of things in here. One is um, HDR TVs are produced in much larger quantities today. And that's really a lot of it is, is how many panels are the panel manufacturers making? What's the economies of scale that they get because of it compared to what they're getting with 4K HDR monitors? There are a lot fewer 4K HDR monitors being built than there are TVs. Um, TVR, TVs kind of have like a two-year head start on us there. Um, I don't think fundamentally there's any technological difference, although keep in mind like that G-Sync HDR has a 384 zone um, uh, uh, backlight on it, which is very high resolution, I guess I would say, for a backlight. Um, and, and a lot of TVs, I don't think any TVs go up that high uh, currently as well. So that's another reason why there's a cost difference. As for 4K 144, I mean, you're, the, the NVIDIA G-Sync HDR monitor does 4K HDR 98 hertz, uh, and to go beyond that is overclocking. So they, um, uh, they're they kind of already at the limit of the spec. So DP 1.4 will probably be where we need to go to go above that. Uh, I didn't bring up the table in front of me, but there's a, there are surely DisplayPort standards in place that will get us to 4K 144 with HDR uh, data rates there. Um, as In terms of when they are released and when they are coming to mainstream prices, I mean, not this year. Probably not even. Probably not even next year. Especially if you're trying to get good quality screens, not just 4K. You'll be able, we'll be able to get 4K 144 probably sooner than that. But if you want 4K 144, good quality screens, HDR, variable zone backlight, all that type of stuff, I think it's going to be. You're looking at at least a calendar year before we get to something, which when I consider mainstream would be like sub one thousand dollar, sub one thousand dollar prices. Kali asks, I just bought a new RX 580, congratulations, and it has a backplate. I've never owned a GPU with a backplate before. It looks pretty, but other than looks, what are or why are backplates a thing? Um, They do look pretty. Um, So a couple of things. One, actually, I think the original reason or the original reason backplates were created on some of these graphics cards was, was on longer video cards where the PCB itself was under a lot of stress because of the weight of the heat sink that was hanging below it, right? And if you've got a graphics card mounted in a case like this, heat sink and fan are below it, the uh, PCB might tend to um, sag a little bit at the back away from the PCI Express slot. So originally, uh, GPU backplates were, were a way to make that more rigid, prevent you know any kind of damage that might happen when you were shipping systems that were pre-built. You know, if you're shipping it in a in a, in a card by itself in a box. It's not a big deal. Uh, But also just prevent that sagging that might occur. Um, Then they became uh, a little bit of a thermal interface, right? So if you had memory on the back of the PCB, you could use that back plate to dissipate off some of that heat, just like a normal heat sink that that would work. And then it became uh, an aesthetics thing as well, where you... Um, 
you know, you put your company logo on the back there, right? Because a lot of the other thing is you see when you look at the front of a graphics card with their heat sink and the logo and the LEDs, when you install it in the system, even with the window, and you're looking at the back of a blank PCB that's very boring, that's kind of disappointing. So now you get cards from Asus and MSI and others that have LEDs in the back plates, logos on the back plates, and that's kind of what they're for. So you'll see back plates on a lot of cards that don't really need them, and probably your RX 580 is under that category. They don't really need it. There's probably not memory on the back of that card. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's there's a few reasons why why they happen to exist. Let's see. Emerald Flame asks, whatever happened to NVIDIA's simultaneous multi-projection that was supposed to fix distortion in multi-screen game rendering? We're two years in, and the only game I'm aware of that supports it is iRacing. When NVIDIA just announced it, or when NVIDIA first announced it, they were really t uh, talking it up and acting like they were going to push developers on it. And it just seems like vaporware now. Uh, I did a little bit of reading on this, and I'm with you. I think the only game that really supports it today is iRacing. Uh, there may be some others that I hadn't heard of. Um, for those that don't remember, simultaneous multi-projection was the idea of um, using the geometry hardware in the NVIDIA GPUs, particularly the Pascal GTX 10 series parts that came out, to um, create, instead of one window... Um, of pixels with which the camera looks from at the virtual space to generate to generate an image, which is what creates distortion at the edges, to instead creating three individual windows. Um, now the problem with doing that before is you could do that before, but it would require three times the geometry work to get done. Obviously, you still have to do all the pixel processing, but it was requiring requiring three times as much pixel setup as well, the geometry setup. And through uh, NVIDIA's geometry hardware, they were able to do that with one pass, much like they did. They pushed a, a very similar feature called um, uh, lens-matched shading in simultaneous, uh, for, for VR, right? So uh, it, did, it did the same, same type of thing. Now, all that being said, None of this matters if you don't actually get game developers to integrate it. And clearly, with iRacing being kind of like the flagship guy there, um, there's there's not any other not any other answers for it. Uh, the as for why developers maybe haven't integrated it, it could have been because the, it was harder to implement than Nvidia led on. It could be that they didn't want to do it if um, you know AMD didn't have the same support. It couldn't do it without. Uh, drastically hitting the performance level of the Radeon hardware. Um, but even that, even still, I would argue that NVIDIA has pushed more features that benefit AMD to the disadvantage, or benefit NVIDIA to the disadvantage of AMD previously, just to make sure that effect or that, that cool feature is out there, which I think is, is still a good idea, as long as you can turn all these things off. Um, so I don't really have an answer as for why, why they haven't done it. Um, and also might be that the number of people that are running multiple displays is very minimal, right, for multi-display gaming. With the uh, acceleration of adoption of the ultra-wide monitors, the 21 by 9s, even the 32 by 9 displays, <coughs> it may be that uh, triple monitor displays aren't very popular. Excuse me. Except for Josh. Josh loves them still. Then he'll never get rid of them. Uh, let's see. This is a good question from Josh Joshua French, who asks, are Micro Center inland drives good? I-N-L-A-N-D. The prices are very low. $75 for the 480 gig and $160 for the one terabyte. But they have very different endurance ratings. 268 terabytes for the 480, 750 terabytes for the one terabyte. Since the, since the drives have a very close price per gig, why does the one terabyte have a nearly 3x endurance advantage? Any plans to officially review these drives? Uh, Josh, we had not seen or known of these drives until your question came in, so thank you very much for doing that. And I was immediately impressed by the price, right? So if you go to microcenter.com, um, this is this is clearly micro inland is micro center's brand that they sell all kinds of different things under not just ssds um, but for 159 dollars and 99 cents you can get a one terabyte drive 3d nand sata drive so that's 15.9 cents per gigabyte getting very close to my stated goal of 10 cents per gig by the end of 2017. Um, I, I think we missed it by just about seven months but we're getting closer every day and that's really what's that's really what's important um, you know, the specs on it are relatively 
tame. They're SATA drives, 500 megs read, 470 megabytes per second write, um, 70, 70K IOPS read and write. It claims to be using 3D NAND flash. We don't know if it's TLC or MLC. Uh, you, would, you would think at these prices that they're TLC. Somebody in a Reddit thread I saw once claimed that they – so we're actually MLC drives, which in which case would be kind of crazy cheap for that type of product, but uh, we don't really know. I think we'll 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 try to get one of these in and actually do some testing. They also offer NVMe drives uh, that are using Fizon controllers. They do have DRAM on them. Uh, looks like Toshiba Flash, I think, but you're looking at a uh, hundred and uh, five hundred twelve gig drive for one hundred nineteen dollars. Right, which is incredibly cheap as well, like twenty three cents a gig for NVMe performance. It's, it's a buy two drive, not a buy four, but there's something there. As for why the endurance ratings are different, I don't, you know, I don't really know. You're looking at somewhere between two and three x the 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 flash on that drive between the four eighty and the one terabyte. Um, you know, it's closer to two x, but it might just have something to do with the over provisioning, or I don't, I don't really have an answer for it. it for for prices. For drives at this price level, you just kind of don't know. You just kind of shrug your shoulders and go. Um, I also think just doing some reading that I haven't found any pictures of the inside of this drive, but they appear to be Fizon based as well, the SATA versions of it too. So um, I wouldn't expect a whole lot of them performance wise, but in much the same way we've previously recommended the Micron 1100, which is like an OEM, um, you know, almost like data center style SATA drive that was relatively cheap, very cheap actually. Um, it's it's worth noting that you know sometimes. If you just want a cheap, fast SSD, you can do that. The Micron, let's see, the Micron 1100 one terabyte comparison is $232 on Amazon. So uh, we're still looking at uh, $70 less than the Micron 1100 for this uh, for this drive, for this inland. The inland professional one terabyte 3D NAND. Actually, it's kind of interesting because the 480 gig clearly says 3D TLC NAND. And that's seventy five dollars, so it's an even better. Eh, it's about the same price per gig on it too. And apparently they had a what was a two hundred forty gig for twenty four dollars. Is that what it was, Alan? One hundred twenty gig drive for twenty four dollars on Amazon. So uh, pretty cheap, pretty cheap. I I want to get one of these in and and mess around with it, and and make sure it's not total garbage. But if you got a micro center near you, they got return policies. So buy it, install it, see if it works, see how fast it runs, and We'll go from there. Thanks, Josh. Uh, let's see. Two more real quick ones. Joseph, uh, I cannot pronounce your last name, Joseph. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, when will autographed Josh Tech prints be available? Um, hasn't come up yet. It depends on whose autograph do you want on it. I assume Josh's. You can have, we can have Ken's if you want. I'd say we'll tell you that. You order 10 of them, and I'll make it happen. I'll buy 10, I'll send them to Josh, and then you distribute how you feel fit. Or you hang all 10 up in your house. I don't care with that. And I'm, I won't even charge you a premium on it. I'll pay for the shipping <laughs> for the 10 units. Uh, because I want photos of Josh, like mass autographing pictures of a cartoon drawing of him as a walrus with a silver Sharpie. That's really worth the shipping cost to me, I feel like. Last question, probably the most important of the episode. Kate Wolf asks, is pizza just fancy cheese on toast? And is it okay to have baked beans or curry on pizza? Or for that matter, haggis? Bonus question, deep fried Mars bar, heaven or hell? Um, you know, I've never had a deep fried candy bar before. I've had like deep fried Oreos, but I've never had a deep fried Snickers or Mars bar or anything like that. I've had deep fried Twinkies. Um, you know, with most things, deep frying them makes them better. Um, I don't think it's good enough for me to feel that bad the next day or the next hour. So I'll say hell to the last bonus question here. Uh, as for is pizza, if you missed the podcast this week, uh, the pre-show on it, for example, you missed the pizza discussion. Is pizza just fancy cheese on toast? Um, yeah, but it, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'm going to go with yes. No, it is not okay to have baked beans on uh, pizza. That is an incorrect thing. Uh, curry, 
So let me admit this. For lunch today, I had something called a backyard brat pizza that had um, some spicy horseradish on it as like a, as a as a dressing with chunks of brat as opposed to chunks of sausage or or pepperoni or what have you. So. Um, I'm really not the right person to be talking about uh, uh, legitimacy of uh, pizza toppings. If you want to add baked beans to it and be wrong about life, it's fine. You can do that. I, I guess I, I guess I won't hurt. I mean, I, you know what? I take it back. I probably had beans on pizza if I'd had like taco pizza, right? Because it's going to have black beans. It's going to have cheddar cheese, shredded cheddar cheese on it, uh, some of that stuff. So I don't know. Put whatever the hell you want on your pizza. I don't know what haggis is. I Googled it beforehand. It has something to do with sheep's offal mixed with oatmeal and seasoning, and it's boiled in a bag. The answer is no to that because that sounds gross. Don't do that. Don't eat whatever that is. Jeremy will correct me, but don't eat that thing. Uh, thanks for joining us this week, guys. If you have questions, again, leave them in the comments section of wherever you're watching this. And uh, we'll be back next week with another one. Thanks, guys.